Um, my name is Sherwood Moore. I'm the chair of the, of the Hyperledger Climate Action and Accounting Special Interest Group. Uh, I'll be presenting today with Bertrand Roux, who is uh, the, uh, the founder and head of Two Ravens Consulting. Um, so today we're going to be talking about open source distributed climate accounting. I'm going to kind of kick off things with just kind of a high level uh, about our, our motivation um, and, and, and kind of inspiration and our objectives. Um, and Bertrand's going to come in and talk about some of the specifics of the prototype that we've been developing. So the Climate Action Accounting Special Interest Group, we really are all motivated. I think we have very similar motivations. And it's around this issue that we're failing to take action around climate. Um, enough action in order to, uh, to meet the Paris Agreement pathway. Um, and, and, and we're continuing to put more and more carbon emissions into the atmosphere. <clears throat> so the question is, you know, why are we doing this? And I believe that there are kind of two, two key reasons. Uh, one is that we don't have a shared distributed climate accounting system that allows us to work from the same numbers. Um, and the second component is that profit motives are not quite aligned yet. There's not enough incentive to drive corporations to really, to, to, to apply, to, to decarbonize and kind of apply uh, the same kind of ruthless efficiencies that they apply to kind of driving down cost as, as they do to carbon. Um, and so I'm going to be speaking a bit about our solution and I think how it touches on both. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Hyperledger Climate Action and Accounting Special Interest Group, we are about uh, 300 members. Uh, we're underneath the Hyperledger umbrella. Uh, we're focused, uh, one of our primary focuses is, is this. We're, we're focused on uh, developing a distributed open source climate accounting system that can balance the emissions activity of the globe uh, against the climate actions in order to achieve this, this net zero future. And so we're focused primarily, a, a lot of our work is on scope one, two, and three. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Um, the reason I share this is because uh, a lot of what we're trying to do is shift co corporate thinking about um, emissions activity. Right now, corporations look at their emissions footprint and they consider it to be a liability. And what we want to do is reshape thinking a little bit to get corporations to really view it potentially uh, as an asset, an asset for, uh, for achieving a sustainable competitive advantage moving into the future um, and, and, and um, kind of ensuring um, the, the success and, and, and health of their organization. So why? Um, the, this kind of shift in thinking is, is that we're seeing different market forces that are, more, that are emerging, that are creating a new reality where corporate profitability is more directly tied to the carbon emissions of, of their goods and services. Um, and, and this is a, a, a phrase I believe that Bertrand coined. I know he's used it quite a bit. Um, but it's this idea of you know, government regulation, consumer demand, green finance, and financial markets kind of coming together to drive different levers um, to, to affect corporate profitability, linking corporate profits uh, to, to carbon emissions. And, um, and so essentially what we see is a future um, where decarbonization is going to be a, a key competitive strategy. And so to break this down a little bit into the basic building blocks, Government regulation uh, is introducing a carbon tax on certain goods imported into the European Union through the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, many of you might have heard of this. Uh, this it, it's focused on just five uh, key carbon intensive, hard, hard to mitigate industries. Um, but this is, this is an operating expense that's emerging. Um, and for those five different industry categories, uh, there's estimations of about $8 billion the, in carbon taxes that are going to be collected by 2030. So that's, that's quite a significant amount. And you can imagine uh, what this will look like and the pressures that it will create as, it as, 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 as this uh, expands into other marketplaces uh, into other kind of product categories. Another one is revenue. And consumer demand for low carbon products and services is increasing. 
Um, there, this is creating opportunities for price premiums, new product categories. Um, the example I have here is the, the electric car market, which uh, reached about $208 billion this past year. So this is revenue. Uh, another one is cost of capital. Sustainable finance is offering preferred rates to corporations that can prove they're lowering, lowering their, their, their carbon footprint. Um, so cost of capital. Um, and about $22 trillion will be injected into the green finance market by 2031. So these are, these are massive movements of, of capital that we're seeing on the horizon. The last is, is market capitalization. Um, investors are rewarding corporations that are actively managing the risk that climate change represents. Uh, and about $130 trillion in investment capital is earmarked uh, to be invested in corporations committed to achieving net zero. This is just from the UN Glasgow Financial Alliance um, that I believe happened at COPPA 26. So we're looking at operating expense, revenue, cost of capital, market capitalization. Like this is the lifeblood of any corporate strategy. And the challenge right now is that in this current state, uh, companies aren't able to get a very good, accurate assessment of what their carbon footprint is. And that's because uh, emissions data, it's siloed and it's fragmented. And essentially what you have is corporations that are they're, they're reaching out to their supply chain, they're, they're kind of inviting input on, on the different emissions activity. This information is stored in a proprietary database. It's published once a year uh, in a static PDF at the corporate level. So the information is just not being shared. And so this is creating key barriers to collaboration and decar for, for decarbonization. Um, there's low trust. Data isn't trusted to be accurate, because it really isn't. It's following fragmented standards. There's a lack of primary data. There's no visibility into the data provenance. Um, so you, you're kind of comparing apples and oranges. There's, there's limited or no access. Data, it's, again, it's siloed in centralized databases. It's reported out at the corporate level, not the product level, locked in annual reports. Uh, and there's a high cost, and that's because Every single emissions activity must be measured, reported, and verified. And to use the data in these siloed reports, you're, you're wading through an ocean of reports. It's just not really an interoperable layer of information sharing. So this is why we are focused on hyperledger, focused on distributed ledger technology, because we think it's really the perfect solution uh, for kind of decentralizing uh, the, the, the ledger on, on which all this emission is being shared, right? Um, so um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, I'm sure you, you are, but um, essentially this is the perfect tool. Oracles allow us to, to reach out to centralized databases to capture data, to, to make any calculations that need to be made, to format it, to bring it into ledger. Smart contracts allow us to code business logic into the system to automate value exchange. The blockchain itself uh, provides, uh, you know, the diff well, Hyperledger permission blockchain provides um, the different pl players in the network to, to kind of co-manage the databases while also protecting the sensitive information uh, that they need to uh, through, um, because it's a permissioned network and all the players know each other within the network. And the last pieces, the last few pieces are distributed governance and open source technology. Um, the entire system has uh, governance built into it so that the participants can co-design the system together, um, co-manage it together. Um, and then the open source technology, this is really critical, right? Because when you look at the magnitude, the scale, the size, the complexity of capturing all this emissions activity across all these different players, everybody's going to have a different need. Um, and so in order to build that, it really, I think, takes and scale it in the, in the, in the time that we have remaining. Um, this requires, I think, open source technology to allow everybody to contribute to building. And that's not just for the, the, the people in the, or the parties in the uh, supply chain. This is also for government regulators, green financiers, um, and, and consumers, we need to essentially use open, take an open source approach to scale to, to meet the, the magnitude of this challenge. And so this is the future state uh, that, that we're working to deliver. Um, a, we developed an award-winning prototype that essentially allows for uh, breaking down these silos. Embodied carbon emissions can now flow through a supply chain with each individual um, party sharing the emissions data that they're responsible for. Um, 
this information uh, is um, uh, provides a, a way for for all of them to kind of share this information um, and, and, and break, break down barriers in order to to kind of provide um, the clear data linkage across the supply chain. So, you know, you can see the how the standards that were used, um, whether primary data was used. Uh, you, can, you can see the, the policy documents and how it was measured, reported, and verified. That's what we're working towards. Um, that's what the, this technology promises. And so ultimately, what we're trying to deliver is this efficient marketplace for environmental data. And this to allow different supply chain participants to work together to identify the hotspots to establish vendor relationships to kind of build uh, and lock in kind of low carbon partnerships, to explore the technologies and the, and the processes and the solutions that can really give them a leg up and kind of get ahead in kind of establishing a competitive advantage built around low carbon emissions. And that's not just for the supply chain parties. You know, as far as an efficient marketplace, what we also want to create is, is a marketplace for that environmental data to be able to be used uh, to, to drive incentives or garner incentives from, or capture the incentives from government regulation, consumer demand, green finance, and financial markets. And the idea is we can pull all these levers together, we can change the financial equation uh, and make it a, a, a lot more um, financially um, interesting for, for corporations to really take a hard look uh, at, at decarbonizing. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to Bertrand, who's going to, who's going to walk through this, the prototype that we built uh, in, in a little bit more detail. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. All right. Well, first of all, thanks to everyone for joining and everyone who's here in the room today and also anyone who's joining the live stream. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to, to listen in on what we're doing. Um, so Sherwood mentioned, while I didn't coin the term measurement economy, it's something I do prescribe to as a legal tender, and it's becoming a very... I think a very uh, useful term um, in the industry to sort of explain you know, how we're using data, in this case environmental data, um, as a driver for economic growth. Um, and as Sherwood has mentioned, you know, we've been developing prototypes and tooling to, to, to demonstrate you know, this technology and function. Um, for full, full disclosure, a lot of this work has been using data from industry, and now we're working on working closer with the actual industry um, so mostly public data they're providing to, to solve problems. And what I'm going to walk through with you today is you know, how that technology can actually solve specific problems for, for these industry players. Just to, to give you some background, I actually come from the, the energy industry, worked, worked for many years in that space, both in oil and gas and electricity, and trying to f work through some of the internal problems they have in managing um, their environmental data, specifically emissions data. And uh, we've actually I've developed a thinking, and a lot of this is actually thanks to some of the conversations I had with, uh, with um, Kyle, who's here with us today. Um, and I know they've done a lot of work on this idea of verifiable credentials and getting information about organizations. So we look at this from two perspectives, as far as how can we apply DLT to this environmental data market for environmental data. The first is the vertical lens, right? And this is really looking into the organization what are the VCs that this organization holds? Um, are, they, you know, are they a standard registry? Um, are they a project proponent that's operating you know, within some, some set of standards? Um, are they a VVB, a validation verification body? They audit and validate. What credentials do they have to do that? Um, it's really looking at the policy documents or the framework with, under which an MRV, a measurement reporting verification system, functions for an organization. The second component here where we see applications of DLT is in the horizontal. And here we're talking about the market instruments within the measurement economy. Offset credits, performance certification. How do we differentiate the commodities that organizations are producing with respect to their greenhouse gas impact? And this really gets down to, as opposed to looking vertically at the organization, tracking results across organizations. So when we talk about this vertical optics, what are we asking? So we're trying to identify who is operating in the data marketplace. And what we're looking at as far as applying solutions is assigning unique digital identifiers. This is something that you know, the British, the BC government is working heavily on um, uh, lo locally on how do we issue digital credentials you know, for individuals or even for organizations. 
and I know Carl has a presentation about this, I think later, maybe, maybe tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, that they could dive into that specifically. And the second question here is, where are these operators' credentials? Where do they come from? They need to be discoverable. Most of the policy documents that are linked to these verifiable credentials issued to the organization. <clears throat> and how do we identify links to the trusted institutions and processes on which these VCs operate, right? So we have this, this sort of system of, of managing identities, right? So this is where we, where, you know, what, the one area we're, look, we're working on, how can we apply the solution? And I'll talk a little bit about the actual technology that we're, we're using and some of the existing solutions that we're, we're building on top of to realize these, uh, these gains or these, these solutions. So now getting back to the second component on the horizontal op optics. First question is, who are the off-takers of environmental data? So an organization has its VCs, it audits and verifies its emission data. Who's the consumer of that data, right? Now you have another organization in the supply chain. So what we're looking at here as far as solutions are developing contractual agreements to enable these transactions between the VCs of an organization, these credentials of the organization. And what are these impacts um, through these cross-organizational transfers? And this gets to the core sort of solution space that we've been working in, which is tracking the value chain, often called the scope three impacts, of emission profiles across organizations. So we have in this diagram below, it's kind of tying these things together. We have the vertical, the VCs for organizations that are used to generate emission profiles, and then a marketplace for exchanging that information through to the emission profile of another organization with its own VCs. So we provide this sort of visibility um, as far as, so the solution space we're building, as far as the business model, how we, how we think about this. So again, we can break this down into two components, the vertical and the horizontal, right? So we have the MRV policy marketplace. So there are companies that make a business off of, you know, establishing standard registries and these different processes of issuing verifiable credentials. So you have industry, right, that engages with various VVBs. Um, some examples, you know, I'll get to later, but you've got the ISO, the International Organization of Standards, that issues a variety of different credentials for verification bodies and a variety of different registries. Vera, for example, is a big issuer of offset credits, so they operate in this space. Right? The second part, component is the emissions data market, and you know, Sherwood has already spoken um, spoken to this. You know, the development of ESG and sustainable finance and consumers of that data. Uh, you know, spoke about value chain reporting and commodity differentiation. So this is again the horizontal, the business model we're looking at. Now, what have we built so far? And this is an ongoing, you know, open source project. If you're interested in looking at the tech, you can just search blockchain carbon accounting online, and it should direct you towards our, our GitHub page. But what we've been working on are there, there are these break it down to these three core components. Data pooling solutions where we can take you know, proprietary enterprise data and sort of connect that into a verification tool, set of tools, set of tools for, ver for emissions verification. And then compiling those into emission profiles, taking these verifiable credentials and putting them into these emission profile wrappers that can be issued as digital assets. And then those operate within this measurement economy where we have the various actors, corporations, um, you know, green finance, players in the green finance space, as, uh, as Sherwood spoke to previously. Um, so what we built, so Sherwood mentioned, you know, we, we had won some, some awards for initial prototype development. Um, this was, there were two elements to that, one under the IBM Call for Code Green Challenge Practice Accelerator. We developed this system for tracking value chain emissions across uh, supply chain, and also a submission to the Hyperledger Challenge in 20, both of these in 2022. Um, so there are some links on the slides here. Not sure if the slides will be shared, but, but happy to uh, send them out to anyone who's interested. A lot of this information can be found um, uh, through the Hyperledger Carbon Accounting Special Interest Group. There are links in the back over there, um, and I'm happy to share it with you after the presentation as well. Um, so identity and digital credentials, the vertical emission data channels, which sort of break down the vertical and the horizontal of communicating, informa uh, aggregating information for the organization so it can be verified, and then feeding into these horizontal objects. We developed, we've been working on this um, network called NET, the Net Emissions Token Network, where we construct these profiles. And I'll just end the, end the presentation in a couple slides with uh, a breakdown of, of what that looks like as far as the horizontal component. 
Um, so diving into the architecture of what we built, so we, I spoke about data aggregation on the far um, left-hand side of the slide, you see essentially the components that go into this, this, this part of the architecture, the, the technology stack, where we're essentially providing a variety of Oracle services, um, which Sherwood mentioned, to aggregate data from mobile, web, or say ERP data feeds. Um, and then continuing on this sort of vertical optics, we have you know, systems for managing data about organizations and converting all of these data sources into useful information. Um, through private data channels, we're working on Hyperledger Fabric, developing Hyperledger Fabric Network to manage enterprise data. Um, working also on the uh, conceptualizing a DAO, where data can be submitted to registries, matching data to VVBs, and also funding pools for you know, these auditors that are, are processing this data, and finally issuing verifiable credentials, and then finally the horizontal, which I've spoken to already, where the data is packaged into emissions data, uh, sorry, emission token profiles. Um, so I, I already mentioned Hyperledger Fabric on the technology stack side. Um, so in this case, you know, Hyperledger Fabric is a permission network, and we're focusing on its use cases for pro processing uh, high volumes of data um, by VVVs and standard registries. Um, we also have a mix of different emission token networks we're working with. Um, we've uh, set up a system to deploy our NAT network, which I mentioned previously on Hyperledger Besu. Um, we're also working with Hedera Hashgraph, um, they have the Guardian protocol, which um, is very, a very useful toolkit um, for managing MRV policy documentation and for establishing a token marketplace. We've also launched our code in some other public networks like Avalanche and Binance. So um, actually missing from this slide, I think we had done some revisions but didn't get, get pulled through the latest version. There are a couple other projects that we're working with and I wanted to mention today. One is Origin Trail, which was a project started in 2019. Um, this is essentially developing a knowledge graph for publishing assets on a distributed ledger. And one of the projects they're working, one of the companies they're working with is the largest issuer of ISO certificate, certificates in the world, um, BSI, the British Standards Institute. ISO certification plays a really important role, obviously, in the VV, VVB space for environmental data. Um, and we're actually right now looking at how to manage ISO certification for in, internal auditors of, say, energy companies that are managing or doing carbon accounting practices to publish that, uh, those verifiable credentials of those auditors on a network that can enable them to then um, audit and publish their data to provide uh, sort of this idea of discoverability, and visibility, that other organizations come, come and say, okay, I'm buying products from this organization with an internal auditor, and I have sort of proof or confidence that their data you know, has been audited up to a specific standard, for example, ISO. Now, there are a lot of other companies, I mentioned BSI, which, which deals with ISO certification, that are play a role in these um, certification and standard registries. Um, so one of the values of using, uh, like Origin Trail, this knowledge, this knowledge graph is that you can publish verifiable credentials on a discoverable uh, ledger from a variety of organizations tied to an individual or you know, representative organization. So you, know, you could do, use, one could say, okay, you could do this with a standard centralized database while well, a distributed system allows you to collate all this information from a variety of different uh, certification bodies. Um, the last thing on this slide, sorry, I digressed a little bit. Um, we've been working with the Hyperledger Cactus or Cacti community, which is primarily focused on interoperability. So I mentioned a lot of different networks here. Um, so within our technology, how do we um, enable sort of these systems to communicate? And Hyperledger Cactus, the open source project, has been very, very useful in that regard. Um, so I'm going to close up the slide just again talking about the horizontal optics. This is a specific project that I've been working on and how I got involved with the, uh, the Hyperledger Carbon Accounting Group. And that's really how do we track emission profiles for an organization um, across a supply chain. And essentially what we were developed, we've been developing since the end of 20, 
2021 and 2022, and it was a part of this submission to the um, uh, accelerator that we won an award for in the Hyperledger Challenge, was designing this non-fungible token wrapper, which essentially it's taking all of these verifiable credentials that you know, describe the emissions profile of organization and how that data was, was uh, derived into a wrapper that describes sort of these product emission impacts or product footprint um, for, for an organization and enables this NFT wrapper, enables the communication of that data across different organizations. This profile, you know, is just an aggregation of different data, whether it's, you know, audited emissions data, retired um, emission uh, tokens, which represent, you know, realized greenhouse gas emissions, or credits that they've purchased or issued. Um, and then we've got these uh, output carbon tracker tokens, which essentially represents products. Because when you're talking about the flow of emissions data, companies aren't really, when you talk about what companies are trading or exchanging, they're not really trading emissions data, right? There is an, ex or an exchange of emission data, they're exchanging products when you're talking about scope three. So the carbon tracker component of this product is really representing those product flows. I'm not gonna go into detail of the functioning, I'd be happy to talk with people after about, about how it works, but this is essentially the, the high, level, high level view of the design we've developed. Um, um, yeah, so just you know, wrapping it up, this NRT, NFT certificate eco ecosystem um, within the scope through reporting space, essentially is designed to provide this you know, flow of information across from primary producer, whether it's energy or commodities, through the intermediaries and then the final consumer. With these NFTs representing this sort of anchor point, you know, a sort of registry of emission, emission profile data that, they can, that all of these different entities in the supply chain can refer to, to have a, a visible and trusted sort of scope three impact um, assessment. Um, yeah, so our, our last slide here uh, is just some opportunities on how you can get involved with the community. Um, so we mentioned some of the, the uh, pilots we're working on. Uh, we have a variety of you know, engagements we're, cur we're currently setting up, um, developing uh, go-to-market strategies, write, writing reports. So if you're interested in participating on that, happy to you know, accommodate or have some conversations with you. Um, we're doing a variety of different research projects, including both financial analysis, uh, on the impact of the measure economy for an indus specific indus industry player. Um, where we're seeking grant funding also to continue our open source development work under this blockchain carbon accounting project we mentioned. We're also looking to trans transition that into hopefully an official hyperledger project. Um, and we also have uh, bi-monthly meetings uh, under the carbon accounting uh, special interest group. Um, again, the links are there in the back. You can easily find it online if you do a search. Um, the readings happen, I think, every second Tuesday of the month, or the, yeah, every other Tuesday, whenever that, that falls. And we also have a specific peer programming calls that um, occur on Mondays, uh, also twice a month as, as needed, you know, as the project picks up. Um, so, I mean, that's, we don't need to dive into the addendum, but that's, uh, that's our presentation for today. Happy to take in your questions and continue the conversation uh, after, the, after, the present, after the session. Thank you.